It's like great introduction, short and sweet. Just thought. <laughs> All right, so I think we're just gonna dive right in. I'm gonna share my screen here. Uh, and of course, because we're approaching the holidays, um, come on, no, stop it, sorry. Here we go, from the beginning, please. There we are. <laughs> um, because it's the holidays, uh, this is a great thing to talk about cookies. I hope maybe um, you are thinking about your holiday cookie baking. I know I am, I'm probably gonna do some this weekend. Um, so I thought we'd just talk a little bit about the history of, of cookies in America. So my talk is called Cookie, yeah, Cookie or Cookie? The History of American Christmas Cookies. Um, and like Trish said, if you guys have questions, you can drop them in the chat. We'll get them at the end. And if you'd rather um, ask your questions verbally, uh, we can let people unmute at the end too. So here we go. Um, if it lets me, good grief. There we are. So I thought we would talk first about, you know, kind of the origins of cookies more generally. Um, so the ancient ancestor of modern cookies is unleavened hard breads, right? And pretty much every culture across the globe that has a grain eating culture has some sort of unleavened hard bread. In Europe, um, they're largely unsweetened. Really the first ancestor of probably what we consider modern cookies with sugar in them uh, was brought into Europe by the Persians. So the Persian Empire had um, explored out to India. India is where sugarcane is uh, indigenous and the Persians brought sugar uh, back to Europe. So they are kind of the, some of the first recorded history of sweetened unleavened hard breads, right? So that's the other ancestor of cookies. Uh, and cookies became super popular in medieval Europe. We're going to be talking a lot about the medieval period um, as we go through the talk and kind of into the early modern period. So um, really into continental Europe, we think that cookies kind of arrived via the Moorish invasion of Spain. Um, and so they brought a lot of those um, baking traditions and Mediterranean traditions and, and contacts with, um, with the, the East, with China, with the Silk Road, all that fun stuff. And so some of the earliest spices that were used uh, in cookies and um, holiday baking in general um, were ginger, black pepper, cinnamon, and saffron. Those all came overland on the Silk Road. And then also available more locally, they had things like wine and almonds, honey, anise, and caraway. And then as we get into the 16th century, the 1500s, that's really like the start of the age of sale, right? In Europe, we have um, all these explorers, all these colonizers, people who are largely looking for shortcuts to Asia. Uh, and the Spice Islands were a huge part of that. Um, Dutch and British uh, merchants and fortune hunters in particular were trying to like bypass Spanish control of uh, the Horn of Africa. They were trying to get around Italian, Venetian control of the overland spice routes by just going straight to the Spice Islands themselves. Um, but they weren't that interested in trading with the indigenous people. They just kind of wanted to take over. Um, so there are a fair number of massacres that happen. Um, there's a book called Nathaniel's Nutmeg because the Europeans were nutmeg mad that goes into specifically um, the Dutch and British interest in nutmeg and the Spice Islands. And it's there's a lot of murder and violence. <laughs> um, Similar things happen with sugar. So like once Europeans wrest control of the Spice Islands um, from the indigenous people and also the Chinese and Arab traders who had been trading with them, um, they start to try and figure out ways to take these indigenous foods and turn them into agriculture and grow them elsewhere. And so by the time we get to the 18th century, um, you do start to have spice plantations, you have sugar plantations, a lot of them are fueled by slave labor, which helps make them a little cheaper. Um, but a lot of these spices start to be introduced to Europe in the 16th century, and they are very expensive and very desirable. So let's talk a little bit about cookies and wealth. You might not think about it today, um, but historically, poor people did not eat cookies. <laughs> 
<laughs> they ate flatbreads and unleavened breads, but cookies were a whole different animal, um, largely because of the scarcity or value of the ingredients, right? So honey and sugar, unless you kept your own bees, um, honey was not super widely available. Sugar was extraordinarily expensive in the medieval and early modern period. Um, it was used more as like a spice itself than the level of sweetener that we're familiar with today. Butter, particularly in the winter months, not super available. Again, if you didn't have, have dairy animals, you didn't necessarily have access to butter. White flour was very labor intensive to produce. Um, unless you lived in a nut grove, you didn't necessarily have access to nuts and certainly not the types of imported nuts like almonds that were very popular with the wealthy um, from the medieval period on. Eggs are also kind of scarce in the winter months. And then of course, all of those expensive imported spices. And I actually left something off of this list, which was dried fruit, imported dried fruit was another expensive rare ingredient. Um, cookies are also not easy to make. Uh, if you are cooking with open flame, you can't roast cookies over the fire. <laughs> Although some, some people uh, in Europe, uh, ancient Europe did figure out ways to make cake like on spits and things, um, but hard to make cookies in open fire. You need a bake oven in order to do that. Um, and really the association I think of cookies with Christmas um, and the holidays in general comes because that's a time of feasting. And also you're going to use um, your best and, and most um, desirable ingredients at these special times that you maybe would not use them elsewhere throughout the year. In the medieval calendar, Christmas, you know, the 12 days of Christmas, you probably know say the 12 days of feasting is actually preceded by a month of fasting, which we don't do anymore. It's just a whole month of eating. Um, but in the medieval Christian calendar, uh, there was several weeks of fasting before Christmas, um, in part because that was um, part of the religious calendar, but also because then you could save up your ingredients um, and your resources to have this, this feasting and also to have all this rest. So you worked really hard um, to kind of prepare the way for the feasting. Uh, and so I think that's kind of why cookies get associated more with Christmas than just about any other holiday um, is because of their association with wealth and scarcity. Um, as I had mentioned, the baking was fairly difficult um, for if you did not own a bake oven. In medieval Europe, most villages did have like a community baker and bake oven. Um, and then of course, wealthy households, uh, great estates and monasteries. Anytime you're producing large amounts of food for a number of people and baking bread, you had a bake oven. But in colonial America, for instance, a lot of people did not necessarily have access to bake ovens in the early colonial period. Um, most cookies are, were also molded during this time period rather than cut, although I do have this lovely little mid 19th century cookie cutter um, pictured here. And the sweeteners also started to change a little bit over time as sugar became cheaper and more widely available. Um, the sweeteners shifted from honey to sugar. And that also may have um, increased the use of cookie cutters because uh, honey sweetened cookies take to mold a little bit better than the sugar sweetened kind do. And then also the original cookies were quite large and would be just baked on the floor of the bake oven. But as they got smaller and daintier and more delicate, you needed tin work, tin sheets um, to bake the cookies on. And so wealthy households were much more able to afford all of these things um, than your average household, really until the mid 19th century when tinware became more affordable and we start to get some other changes in kitchen technology that make things, um, make cookie baking easier. And then of course also there were throughout history professional bakers that you could purchase cookies from. Um, it's really kind of on an individual basis until the late 18th, early 19th century when you start to get um, close to more mass production as, as we industrialize. So this is an illustration uh, depicting a medieval bake oven. They're actually baking bread, but for those of you who don't know, a bake oven is basically a big hollow um, heat 
heat uh, absorbing uh, structure, right? So you light a fire inside and let it heat up and then the smoke like comes out the front, there's no separate chimney. And then when it's all nice and hot, you rake the coals out. In this case, they're just raking them to the front. And then you place whatever you're baking on the floor of the oven. And then you put the door on and often you would seal it with clay. And bake ovens take a long time to heat up. They're usually only fired once a day. And you have to be super prepared to bake everything in sequence. So you bake the things that need the hottest oven first, things like, um, like breads, right, need really hot, um, uh, really high heat. And then you kind of go to sending like probably, you know, cookies and cakes would be next, and then maybe pies. And then toward the end, usually the last thing you would do is you would put um, a pot of beans in the bake oven and shut it and leave it overnight. So all that, it's like a slow cooker, all that residual heat is just slowly cooking the beans. Um, that's especially um, useful in religious communities. Uh, so for Jewish communities on Friday evening, right, they would, they would put that food in the bake oven and leave it until Saturday. And for Christian communities, it was on Saturday night and leaving it for Sunday. So you didn't have to do labor on Shabbos or, or the Sabbath, right? Um, shaping the cookies, we talked a little bit about that. We talked about cookie molds being very medieval. I have some pictures of specific molds to kind of illustrate. Cookie cutters date back to the 15th century, but they're really not in widespread use until the 19th century. Um, because tin becomes much more affordable uh, and is much easier to use and much less expensive than things like pewter or silver, which would have been some of the early cutters. Um, and then there's also the cookie press. We will be talking about spritz in a little bit, but that's really um, a very popular cookie that requires a cookie press. So there, there, are, there is evidence that they did have similar presses dating back to the 16th century. But spritz really takes off after World War II, thanks in large part to the Miro Aluminum Company um, developing a cookie gun in the 1930s, which is probably the cookie press that we're all familiar with today. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about this image because um, I have a theory about it. So this is a patent image from uh, 1895 for a spring-loaded biscuit cutter. And it was developed by a man named Alexander P. Ashburn, who was a formerly enslaved person who went on to apply for a number of patents, including um, coconut oil processing. And a lot of um, what I've seen on the internet is people are talking about, oh, he's using these to cut like the fluffy Southern American biscuits. But I am not convinced that that's the kind of biscuit that they're cutting. I think this is a cookie cutter um, in large part because although these are very fairly deep or they look fairly deep, like fairly deep cutters, um, how would you get the biscuit out, you guys? <laughs> Whereas if it's just you're just making a cut into flat cookie dough, um, I think that might be a little bit easier. And also I'm not sure a heart shape would hold up very well for biscuits. I could be wrong. It could be the, you know, Southern American fluffy style biscuits, but they did, Americans did use um, the term biscuit to refer to a specific type of cookie uh, really until the late 19th century, um, particularly uh, mass produced biscuits. Um, so could go either way. That's just my little theory I want to talk about. So let's talk about the terminology, right? That was part of the description. Why do the British call them biscuits and we call them cookies? It has to do with language and where we got our language from. So the British get biscuit from the French um, and it's actually have the hyphen in the wrong place. It should be B-I-S hyphen Q-U-I-T. So biscuit means twice cooked, right? Or cooked twice. Cui means to cook. Um, and bis being obviously twice, we still have that Latin root in our modern language. Italian biscotti means the exact same thing. Although um, what we consider biscotti today are actually twice baked. Um, that was not the case with most of the cookies that get the name biscuit um, in, Fran in France and England. So why do Americans say cookie? We speak English, why don't we say biscuit? Um, 
has to do with the Dutch. Uh, thanks, New York, right? Dutch New York is is where we get that term from. Um, the Dutch word kick, yeah? I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, kick means cake, and kick, yeah, is like a diminutive of cake. So it means a small cake, right? And that's what we use to describe um, cookies, right? There are some other languages have some kind of interesting ones. Um, other Germanic languages like Norwegian, it's similar. Small cake means small cake. Um, the Spanish are very different from the other Romance languages. They call cookies galleta, and no one is really sure why they call cookies galleta. There's no real clear linguistic origins. Um, you know, the Latin root is similar to one that means gallon. So maybe it's a quantity thing. I don't know. Anyway, nobody really knows. Um, and then the German is Plätchen, which often is translated as a little place, a small place, right? But it's derived from Platz, which is a flat round cake, right? So it's probably a diminutive of Platz rather than a location, right? Um, so yeah, that's just some of the interesting terminology around cookies, but that's why we say cookies. Why we call our scone-like things biscuits? I don't know. <laughs> but definitely uh, that's why the British say biscuit and we say cookie. I also did just this fun little Google engram about the spelling of cookie. I did 1800 to 1950. For those of you who aren't familiar with Google engram, it um, basically searches all of the text in Google Books and shows you how many hits there are based on the, the publication date of the book. Um, so I didn't go to the present because if I did, the blue line would have totally dominated and you would not be able to see the other ones. Um, so I kept it to 1950 so you could see some of these like cookie with an E, E-Y kind of has like a little bump here. I-E is kind of popular in the late 19th century and then in the um, teens, cookie with a Y kind of overtakes, and then cookie with an IE starts to take off. So um, I just thought it was interesting that there's not really a super standardized spelling um, until today. And even today, cookie with a Y um, is still technically considered correct, but it is like a more archaic spelling. All right, so I talked a little bit about the Dutch origins of cookies. So let's talk about the Dutch. Um, in New York, they are our first uh, European colonists, right? So the Dutch colony is from about 1614 to 1664 when the British take over. Um, and interestingly, cookies in this period were more associated with funerals and New Year's Day. Um, and that is in part because of the Puritans. <laughs> the Puritans hated Christmas. They thought it was an evil, pagan, Satanist holiday and that no one should celebrate it. Um, and that it was just to like convert pagans to Christianity, which is largely true. Um, so they did not like to practice it. And so um, some of the other Europeans kind of like in deference to the violence of feeling <laughs> of the Puritans kind of didn't celebrate it either. Um, the first print reference to the word cookie is from 1703. It is in reference to 800 cookies being produced for a Dutch funeral in New York. Um, so again, it's kind of like this association more with funerals than with Christmas. However, um, the Dutch do have a very long tradition of having a specific cookie with St. Nicholas Day, which is December 6th. That's like the heart, the start of the holiday season. It's like the old, um, I forget if it's is it the Julian calendar, and we're on the. So they would serve speculus, which is like a cinnamon, a crispy cinnamon cookie, kind of like gingerbread, but not really. Um, if you've ever had a Biscoff cookie or a windmill cookie, you have had speculus. Um, and so, you know, I think they did kind of still celebrate that in the colonies, but like maybe on the down low, so the Puritans didn't get mad. Uh, and then I found this great image from a fairly famous book of Dutch poetry published in 1850, all about St. Nicholas. Here he is with his bishop's mitre. Very different depiction from Santa Claus in our American tradition, but here he is delivering a giant 
um, speculous cookie to this excited, started, startled looking boy. Um, so gingerbread is kind of like the one connector cookie across the European cultures. Um, it was eaten throughout medieval Europe, although probably most famous in um, what is today Germany and the surrounding areas. Um, I have a friend who is also a food historian. His name is Neil Di Marino, and he is um, a food historian of uh, the um, 18th century, largely and earlier. And he is a meticulous recreator of historic recipes. And he did a program on gingerbread and made a whole bunch of versions, including one of the earliest published references or recipes to gingerbread, which is basically um, just honey, breadcrumbs, and ginger from the 1300s. He made it, I tried it, not great, not terrible, not terrible, but I probably would not choose to eat more than one. Uh, however, in the 1300s, sugar was extraordinarily rare. Most people were sweetening things with honey and people were not eating a lot of sweets. So um, I think probably it, it landed a little different in the 14th century than it does today where we have access to sweet things everywhere. And also as Americans, we have giant sweet tooths compared to the rest of the world. Um, also interestingly in medieval Europe, um, again, before the spice trade was bringing a lot of spice from the Spice Islands, black pepper and in addition to ginger were the two um, main spices in a lot of gingerbread recipes. Um, and then also cinnamon was another one, but black pepper you do find in a couple of, of very old gingerbread recipes. Um, for instance, Pfeffernusa, although those ones are a little bit more recent and they have um, more than just black pepper, but pepperhocker, which is a Swedish Norwegian, um, very thin, crisp ginger, uh, ginger cookie. Um, black pepper is very forward. In, in those cookies. And we don't necessarily think of black pepper as a sweet spice, uh, but it's not that different from a lot of other spices, right? That kind of spicy, hot flavor being associated with, with sweet things. So um, in England, one of the first references to gingerbread um, is, or gingerbread men specifically, is Queen Elizabeth I um, has a big diplomatic feast and she has gingerbread figures of all of the diplomats baked for the feast. And so they would have looked um, something a lot like this. This is um, a gingerbread and marzipan mold from the 1750s in Germany. And it looks like it's reversed, but it's just an optical illusion. It's actually set into the mold and you would press the dough into the mold and so that it's flush with the top of the mold and then you'd like flip it out and bake it like that. And so they're quite large usually, and these very detailed figures. And there was a lot of folklore around gingerbread, these molded gingerbread figures. Um, so like if you wanted to get married or you were looking for a spouse, you might buy a gingerbread cookie like this of a couple. Uh, if you wanted to get pregnant, you might buy the Christ child. Uh, if you wanted a house, <laughs> you might buy a little, figure that has a house on it. You know, so there is all this folklore kind of associated with what type of gingerbread you should buy. Um, and again, the molds were far more common than, than like what we think of today. Gingerbread men is like a little figure that's a cutout. It's like very stylized. No, they were very detailed, very three-dimensional um, and hard to find in this day and age. So, um, I just also wanted to share this image. So I talked a lot about how cookies were really the purview of the wealthy, right? That they're the ones who are making them in any quantity. But gingerbread specifically was professionally made um, quite early on, often by, um, you know, like monastic orders or by seeing it's called various people in front of an illuminated stall at a church fair. And this stall is full of gingerbread. These are all shelves of gingerbread and the heart shape um, with green candied citron in the middle is one of the most popular. I think in large part because everybody wants love, right? So the folklore behind the heart shape ones is you buy those if you want love. All right, so our next uh, colonial holding in the Americas is the British, right? They take over from the Dutch, uh, but the British don't have a ton of cookie traditions. 
Um, their big holiday, you know, Christmas related desserts um, are primarily the Christmas pudding. And the Sunday before Advent was called stir about or stir it up Sunday when the whole family would get together and combine all the ingredients for the pudding. And then um, you would feed it brandy <laughs> every day until it came time to boil it for Christmas. Um, mince pies, mince meat pies, which did originally contain um, beef and venison in addition to suet. Most modern mince meat only contains suet, no meat. Um, were very popular. Fruit cake, uh, that is the descendant of the, the medieval great cakes, where again, they're using all those super expensive imported ingredients, um, spices, honey, almonds, and marzipan, dried fruits, um, and alcohol. Originally wine, and then later distilled alcohol like brandy, um, which serves as a preservative, right? So fruit cake was popular. Gingerbread, was popular and also shortbread, which is um, more original to the UK, but not to England. And then of course, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert really start to change um, British traditions in the mid 19th century and by extension, American traditions. We were still very influenced by British culture and uh, the monarchy in America, even though we did not have our own monarchy. Um, but the fashion was often set in Europe. And so uh, when Queen Victoria married Prince Albert, Prince Albert was from Germany. And so he introduced a lot of traditions to the Anglo world, um, including the Christmas tree. If you were not of German descent in the United States and Great Britain, you did not have a Christmas tree at Christmas. You had greenery and kissing balls and mistletoe and all that fun stuff, but you did not have a tree unless you were actually German prior to Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. So they really helped popularize that for um, people outside of Germany and who did not have German heritage. So this is just a great little postcard from the 1870s, um, even though it has like the ye olde timey <laughs> uh, text on it. That's kind of hearkening back to, um, you know, an earlier age. And also, uh, I didn't mention this, but Dickens has a huge influence on how Christmas is celebrated in both the UK and the United States as well. Um, but so this is the ye merry Christmas time, ye family stir about, right? And so they are making, this is stir about Sunday, they are making the pudding and all the family members have their own spoon because again, the folklore is if everybody has a stir and you make a wish, then it's like your wish ripens with the pudding. And then when you cook the pudding and eat it on Christmas, then your wish is supposed to come true. So, and it's also good luck for everyone in the household to take a stir at the pudding. Um, I did mention shortbread. Shortbread is, uh, originates in Scotland. Earliest reference that we know of is the 12th century, so the 1100s, quite early. Um, but it doesn't get to be super widespread until the 17th century. 16th century in Scotland, not so great. There's plague, there's famine, there's all kinds of negative things happening. The 17th century, things start to look up a little bit more. Um, they expand uh, their economy by trading with English markets. Um, dairy cattle herds, you know, increase exponentially. And with that increase in dairy becomes comes a much larger supply of butter, right? Which is one of the primary ingredients in what we consider shortbread today. Mary Queen of Scots was also said to be quite fond of shortbread, so she helped popularize it. And then of course, Queen Victoria, um, obsessed with Scotland, that was like their vacation home, right? She popularized tartan, she popularized bagpipes, um, and also helped popularize shortbread. Uh, so shortbread historically was also molded uh, much like gingerbread. This is a modern picture, but it's got kind of this historical mold with the little thistles on it, right? The symbol of Scotland. And uh, traditionally, Scot uh, Scottish shortbread is cut into wedges rather than like, you know, individual cookies. So you would bake the big piece in a mold, which also meant like gingerbread, you could bake it on the floor of the bake oven instead of having to have like a tin sheet. Um, and then you would cut it into wedges to serve it. In the United States, why do cookies become so popular in the United States? There's a whole bunch of factors to take into account. Um, one of which is that the United States, the average person in the US had much more 
wealth and access to resources than their counterparts in Europe. Um, that's true pretty much from the beginning. Um, and that's true in large part uh, because uh, Americans outsourced most of their labor uh, to enslaved people, um, particularly in the production of important cooking ingredients like sugar. Um, and also into, particularly in the early period until the American Civil War for most of the country, to the hard labor of making and baking food, right? Um, if you have an uh, enslaved cook or kitchen staff, or if you have, uh, you know, servants, it is much easier to just order up super complicated, very labor intensive foods because you don't have to do it yourself, right? Um, the other thing is that uh, as we get westward expansion, ingredients like white flour become super cheap in large part because we're, you know, violating treaties right and left, <laughs> stealing land from indigenous people. <laughs> um, so like pretty much the entire bread basket of America, uh, you know, is because we got that land for free. Um, and also because we have technology like, uh, railroads and canals and there's milling technology um, that allows the production of very fine uh, white flour that becomes a primary ingredient in cookies. We also, as we're urbanizing, we have a lot more professional bakers and caterers who are able to produce um, for a price some of the more labor-intensive foods that we might not have access to at home. Um, and then also, you know, a lot of immigrants coming to the United States are bringing their own Christmas traditions, many of which revolve around um, cookies and these sort of ancient medieval traditions around cookies. So this is a, a, a more typical, uh, more modern version of a bake oven, right? This is still probably a professional um, bakery because you see there's all these peels up top. He's got the broom and he is putting in, um, you know, he's got all the multiple things lined up to be baked as the bake oven cools. This could also be in like a wealthy household, but um, your average housewife did not have access to all this equipment. And if she had a bake oven, it was probably set into the side of her, her open hearth fireplace. Um, so let's talk a little bit about immigration. Just a brief, very general overview about like the types of immigrants who are coming into the United States at different times. So our first um, colonists, and immigrants in the 18th, 17th and 18th century. We have um, English, Dutch, Spanish, and Scottish. And then there are also uh, religious groups like the Moravians, the French Huguenots, the Palatine Germans. Those are some of our first European immigrants. Um, in the early 19th century, you have a lot of Germans and Irish, particularly as you approach the mid 19th century, Irish fleeing the potato famine. The mid to late 19th century, um, you had Scandinavians and Italians, uh, Bohemians, right? Germany is not unified at this point. Um, you have Middle Easterners, Eastern European and Chinese and other Asian people also emigrate to the United States, particularly to the West Coast in very large numbers um, until the Chinese Exclusion Act in the 1890s. And then pretty much all Asian immigration is just completely halted. The turn of the 20th century into the early 20th century, we have Russians and Eastern Europeans, um, especially Jews escaping pogroms. Um, we have Greeks, Lebanese, and Syrians. Syrians in particular come in like the 1890s, the 1920s, uh, and of course after World War I. Um, but their first wave of immigrants uh, is people who had been silk farmers. And there's like a huge decimation of mulberry trees in Syria, which is where you grow and feed silkworms. So a lot of those people uh, had to leave because they could no longer make a living in their home country. So just an interesting little tidbit I learned about American immigration. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a couple of these groups and their influence on, on Christmas cookies in the United States in particular. The Moravians being the oldest and possibly most famous of the Christmas cookie bakers. The Moravian church is a very old Protestant church. It's actually um, the first Protestant church. It's founded in the Czech Republic in, I believe, the 1470s. Um, Martin Luther doesn't nail up his 95 theses until the 1510s. And they are the first Protestant missionaries 
So obviously Catholic missionaries, Jesuit missionaries um, had been around for a while, but they are the Moravians are the first Protestant missionaries. Um, in 1740, they come to the Hudson Valley and found a mission with the Mohican people in what's today Dutchess County. Um, but you know, it was a British colony at that point and uh, religious missionaries among the indigenous people made British colonists think that they were French Jesuit spies trying to get the Mohicans to fight on the side of the French in the French Indian War. So they were expelled from New York in 1744. A number of them had already settled in Pennsylvania. So that group went and joined their brethren in Pennsylvania. Um, and then another group also settled in and founded Salem, North Carolina. Um, they are fairly famous, not only for uh, Moravian stars, but also their cookies. So they are, there's a spice cookie, a molasses cookie, and most importantly, a sugar cookie that they develop as part of their love feast celebrations around Christmas. Um, Winston-Salem, North Carolina is still very well known for um, Moravian cookies. Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, slightly less so. They're more known, I think, for the stars and the other Christmas celebrations. Um, but I think these sugar cookies, my theory is that these sugar cookies are like the antecedents of the modern American sugar cookie. Uh, the Germans also influential in the types of Christmas related cookies. There's a whole bunch. Um, I'm just gonna talk about a couple of the older ones. We have Lebkuchen, which is German gingerbread. And I found this great image of the Lebkuchner, right? This guy who's probably a monk judging by his his uh, outfit here, this is from 1520 thereabouts. He's got these big giant molded gingerbreads that he's about to load into his bake oven. So these kind of intricate molds, um, very typical of Lebkuchen and other gingerbreads at the time. There's also Springerly, which is a very unique cookie that's very old, dates back to the 1300s in Swabia. Zimsterna um, are from the 17th century. That's an interesting cookie that makes kind of a resurgence in the 20th century in the United States. Uh, Pfeffernusa, of course, one of the more popular ones. Um, not invent invented really until the 1750s, and that is in large part because they contain a number of um, spices that are not available until uh, we get that, that um, age of sale, right, and Europeans invading the Spice Islands. And then, of course, how do these traditions get to the United States. We have Palatine Germans coming very early on, um, the Pennsylvania Deutsch, right? For a long time, I think a lot of people thought the Pennsylvania Dutch were actually from the Netherlands. They are German. Um, and then, of course, as in England, um, a lot of German Christmas traditions were popularized in the United States uh, with the marriage of Queen Victoria to Prince Albert of Germany. Um, and this is just a fun little illustration I found, a German postcard from the early 20th century depicting all the Christmas goodies, right? So there's like fruit cakes and nuts and like apples and oranges, right? And then these, these cookies in the foreground here. So these are chocolate covered Lebkuchen. And then this is a more traditional one with the green citron, candied citron in it. Um, not sure if this is a cake or a cookie in the foreground, hard to tell, but just an example. Um, I do have a couple of recipes that, you know, they're historical, so I'm not expecting you to reproduce them, but just to give you an idea of, of how the cookies are produced. So um, Springerly are very interesting. Uh, they are very much associated with molds, right? It's not Springerly if it hasn't been molded. So they had wooden molds like this one. This is from a magazine called American Cookery, which is associated with the Boston Cooking School, uh, which is where Fanny Farmer trained. <laughs> Um, and they're very interesting cookie. They're very white and they're anise flavored, but they don't actually have anise in them. They are baked on top of anise seed so that the anise like infuses the cookie as they're baking. Um, this is another recipe. You can see the primary flavor agent is lemon. They don't have any other spices in them besides anise seeds. So that gives you a clue as to how old the cookie, cookie is. It predates that, that access to, ready access to the Spice Islands. Um, and then this is a more modern picture depicting the molds and the very fine, very white detailing you can get um, from Springerly. You do also sometimes see wooden uh, rolling pins 
with the squares and molds cut in them so you could roll them out that way. Um, but a lot of people do still use the individual molds as well. Uh, lab kuchen is a little bit different from what we consider gingerbread uh, in the United States. This is an older recipe. This uh, recipe is from the uh, settlement cookbook. And you can tell it's older because it just has cinnamon and citron and, excuse me, almonds. Um, this number two recipe is much more complicated and much more recent because it has the spice. It's got molasses right from the Americas. It's got, um, you know, allspice and nutmeg uh, and chocolate, all of which would have been, you know, like 15, 1600s and later, um, which I find very interesting. Um, and then it's frosted, it's iced, unlike the other one. So this is a more modern version of Leibkuchen and you can see it's a cutout rather than a mold and it's decorated with frosting. And I think that starts to be um, you know, as sugar gets less expensive um, and as we start to have more mass production of these cookies, it's much faster to use uh, cookie cutters than molds and then to decorate with frosting rather than to use those um, kind of fussy and sometimes complicated molds, even though they do make spectacular looking cookies. Uh, Fethranusa, I love this recipe because it's so American. You know, it's got corn syrup and New Orleans molasses. Right, and then the flavoring is um, cinnamon and cloves. And again, with the citron and the almonds and then lemon, that seems to be the theme in uh, German cooking. Although this one uh, says that almonds and citron may be omitted, I guess if you can't find or afford them. Zimsterna, this recipe is from a 1950s edition of The Joy of Cooking. Uh, and this recipe interests me because it is gluten-free. It's just sugar and egg whites and cinnamon and lemon and almonds, right? There's no flour in them. So they're kind of like a macaroon. They're always cut into stars. Sometimes they're frosted, sometimes they're not. Um, but just kind of a, a fun older recipe. And then Italian immigrants also have a fair amount of influence on our Christmas cookie traditions. Although I think fewer people who are not Italian bake these cookies. Um, so we have pizzelle, which are a very thin, uh, crisp wafer with like almost like an embossed surface uh, related to Dutch waffles. The early Dutch waffles were very similar. Um, and also krim kaka, which we'll, Scandinavian cooking we'll talk about in a bit. Um, biscotti, of course. Amaretti, those are my favorite, the chewy almond cookies. Um, and then like the like quintessential Italian-American Christmas cookie is the agnetti which is a frosted anise cookie, anise flavored cookie, um, often decorated with sprinkles, rainbow sprinkles. If you've seen those maybe in um, some Italian cookie trays at bakeries and delis. Uh, Strofoli, which are only sort of a cookie. They're like these teeny little balls of fried dough held together with honey. And then probably the most famous Italian American Christmas cookie is the tricolore or rainbow cookies. Um, if these are done well, they are very good. If they're not done so well, they're not so great. Um, but it's a tinted almond sponge, right? They color the almond sponge. Sometimes there's a little bit of marzipan in there. And then it's apricot and raspberry jam with chocolate on the outside. And I said Italian American because this cookie was invented in the United States in support of Italian unification in the late 19th century. Um, we don't usually call them tricolore because they got to be so popular that Jewish delis started making them as well. And so they, they didn't really care about Italian unification. So, so hence the name change. Um, but that's one of the reasons why they're so popular. I didn't include any recipes for these in large part because I could not find any easily in my historic cookbooks. Um, and I think that is in large part because uh, it's just so easy to buy them. Particularly if you live in the Northeast, it's pretty easy to find a, an Italian bakery or a deli where you can get um, you know, the special uh, Italian cookies at the grocery store. I was just at the grocery store and they had like a whole display in the front of all the Italian Christmas cookies. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the recipes do exist if you want to look them up, but I can only find modern ones, not historic ones. Um, just a picture of some biscotti for illustration. And then the one that's near and dear to my heart are the Scandinavians because I am 100% Scandinavian descent, Norwegian, Swedish, and Danish, and that's it. Um, 
And so these are my favorites. So I grew up eating pepperkoke, which they serve in um, all three of the Scandinavian countries, uh, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. And I love these because they're spiced with black pepper. And there's very, they're a very thin, very crisp cookie. They're usually in a star or a heart shape. Um, and the tradition in my family is if you have a heart shaped one and you put it in the palm of your hand and you press in the middle and it breaks into three even pieces, then you can make a wish, right? All this fun cookie folklore. Um, spritz, which may be German first and then Scandinavian, it's not super clear who started it, um, but that is like a very soft uh, cookie that you squeeze out of a tube. Uh, Fatima which is like means poor man um and these are deep fried cookies usually little flat pieces um that with a hole cut like a just a slice in the middle um so that when you fry them it kind of like puffs up with a little hole in the middle i think it's to make frying them easier Pumkaka, which are pictured here again very similar to pizzelles not clear who did it first um probably the Italians or the Dutch, and then it went to Scandinavia, um, but they are rolled. They're not served flat. And it, because of that, they are very thin. Like the best cream cock are like, if you touch them wrong, they break. <laughs> um, so pizzelles are much, are much sturdier and thicker, um, but very similar flavor. Uh, and then one of the latter ones is Sandvakdelse. And they are not brought around until the 1850s. And that is because they rely on a special baking tin. And we did not get great tin smithing um, and affordable tin smithing until the mid 19th century. So I have a couple of recipes for these. Um, I'm originally from North Dakota and I found this great agricultural college like circular on Google Books. It's called Recipes from Many Lands. And it's all these immigrant recipes including, of course, a ton of Scandinavian ones. Um, and so there's like a million <laughs> Scandinavian recipes. I picked this one because um, I think it's very interesting. It calls for syrup and sour cream, but then it's got that classic clove, cinnamon, black pepper, ginger combination, and it has zero instructions on how to make that. <laughs> it calls for a gallon of flour, right? So it obviously makes a lot. Um, but no instructions for, for how to make it, which I find hilarious. Um, spritz, like I said, not super clear if they are German or Scandinavian first. Um, the Germans tend to uh, shape them into an S, the Scandinavians into a ring, um, and then the Germans like to dip theirs in chocolate, which I'm like, it doesn't need chocolate at all. Um, but spritz cookies in particular in, see like a huge use of spritz outside of Scandinavian and German communities in large part of the 1950s, uh, thanks to two things. One is that we have that 1930s Miro cookie gun, which makes it a lot easier than like a pastry bag. Um, and two is that the World War I or World War II is over in the 1950s and all of a sudden you can have white flour and butter and sugar again. And that's basically what these cookies are with a little bit of egg. Um, you have to have the egg so you can extrude it, otherwise um, it would be too brittle and you couldn't do that. But so these are a couple recipes for that. Sometimes flavored with almond flour, that's the kind I grew or almond extract, that's the kind I grew up with. Um, and then I thought it interesting that there are like a million Sandvakelsa recipes in this cookbook. This is how many there are. <laughs> um, so this is like a, a very rich, crumbly cookie that is pressed into a tin. It does usually leave a little bit of a divot. So you could put something in it like jam or cream or whatever. Most people don't, they just eat them plain. It is a lot of butter um, and flour and sugar. Uh, and then you put you press it into those tins and you bake it. And you have to leave them cool in the tins. Otherwise, you know, like the cookie just is too soft and it collapses when you take it out. So this is what they look like. There's all these different little designs of tins, diamonds and hearts and circles and all kinds of fun stuff. Um, I grew up with the heart shaped ones and they're just a plain butter cookie. That's like the Scandinavian trademark, delicious plain butter cookie. <laughs> uh, Fatiman are a little bit different. Um, they don't have any, uh, any fat in them usually, um, which is a little bit 
interesting compared to most of the other ones. Some of them call do call for heavy cream to make them, um, but the fat comes from frying them. And then the cream cock I included, again, a million recipes. You can see a lot of the uh, um, phonetic spelling cream cock good instead of cream cock good. Um, and I like this because there's all three countries, <laughs> Swedish, Danish, and Norwegian. So we also have some distinctly American cookie, Christmas cookie traditions that kind of spring out of our American culture that are not related to any one um, immigrant group. Um, probably the most quintessentially American Christmas cookie is the peanut butter blossom, which we'll get to in a minute. But peanut butter and chocolate, other countries do not eat peanut butter for dessert if they eat peanut butter at all. Um, and peanut butter and chocolate, that's American started that. <laughs> Nobody else really does that. Um, Mexican wedding cookies, also known as Russian tea cakes and a whole bunch of other names. Um, cookie cutouts that are not gingerbread. So like sugar cut, cut out sugar cookies or other like rolled and cut cookies um, are very American. Also frosted sugar cookies you've seen. There's no frosting except for maybe on some of the lab cooking in any of these cookies so far. Um, Americans love their frosting, right? We put frosted cookies are like our favorite. Um, and then also all the decorations, the colored sugar, the sprinkles, a lot of the historic Christmas cookies, if they're decorated, they're decorated with plain white royal icing and with dried fruit or candied fruit um, or nuts. No, Americans have to have color. So we want our colored sugar and sprinkles and frosting and all that fun stuff. Um, the peanut butter blossom, again, like I said, very distinctly American. Uh, it's entered into the 1957 Pillsbury Bake Off contest. The Bake Off baking contest had been around since 1949, post-war, right? End of sugar rationing in 1947. Um, and it was to promote Pillsbury flour and other Pillsbury products. So um, Mrs. Chester Smith enters in the Black-Eyed Susan cookie, which Pillsbury chooses to rename the Peanut Blossom or the Peanut Butter Blossom. Um, and she doesn't win. <laughs> she wins in her category, which is the Senior Citizen category. Um, but she doesn't win the, grant, the overall prize. However, because it contains Hershey Kisses, Hershey Kiss starts printing the recipe on the back of the bag, and it's so easy and so delicious that by the 1960s, it's like everywhere, um, and it continues to be on holiday cookie trays today. If you walk into somebody's house and there's an assortment of Christmas cookies, this might be one of them. Then there's that one cookie. <laughs> that has kind of a murky history. A lot of countries have very similar cookies. Um, it's probably Middle Eastern. There are a number of Middle Eastern, like crumbly nut-based cookies with powdered sugar um, that date back to the Middle East. Uh, probably originally made with almonds or walnuts. Probably came to Europe, again, via the Moorish invasion of Spain. Um, and then, of course, Spain brought it to the New World. And once they started producing it in Mexico, they used pecans, which are indigenous to the Americas. Um, it is served uh, at Mexican weddings, often in a crescent shape. Americans tend to make them in like these ball shapes. Sometimes they're called Russian tea cakes. They are not Russian. I was trying to find a historic recipe for these um, under the name Russian tea cakes. I found a Russian tea cake recipe that was for cake that was meant to be served with tea. <laughs> it was not this cookie recipe. Um, no one really knows where the name came from. There is a theory that Russian tea rooms were very popular in the late 19th century in a lot of big cities. And so this cookie may have come to be associated with that. Again, no real documentation for that. We just know that they're not Russian. Russians do not eat these cookies. Um, sometimes, in, especially in the 1950s, you see them called snowballs. Uh, the term Mexican wedding cake takes off in the 19th Soviet Union and the Cold War, <laughs> so we can't call them Russian tea cakes anymore. Um, and then some people argue that they're pecan sandies. I disagree. Pecan sandies do not have powdered sugar, people. They're, they're a whole different animal. Um, so why also do we leave out cookies and milk for Santa? That's a very American thing to do. 
Um, other countries do leave out treats for magical Christmas visitors. Uh, in Norway, there are these little like house elves called Nissa, who are came to be associated with with Christmas. They get a rumigrut, which is like a cream porridge on Christmas Eve. Um, in Sweden, a Swedish counterpart of the Nissa, the Tomte, again like a little friendly house spirit, uh, gets rice pudding. In Britain, Santa gets sherry. <laughs> with or without cookies. Uh, in Germany, they don't give food, but children do leave letters for Santa if they haven't mailed theirs yet. In the Netherlands, they leave carrots and hay for either St. Nicholas's um, mule or donkey, I think he comes in on, uh, or they'll leave it for the reindeer, right, trying to butter up Santa's helpers. Um, but in the United States, we do cookies and milk. We don't really know why specifically it's cookies and milk, um, probably because there's just dairy farms everywhere in the United States historically, and also because milk is very closely associated with children in American food history because it's considered like a healthful um, children's beverage. Um, there is a theory that in the early colonial period in particular, really up until we get like railroads, um, that the roads are terrible. <laughs> And so, and people often are traveling during the holidays and traveling long distances, and there's not a lot of inns, you know, there, maybe there's a tavern 20 miles down the road, but your house might be the closest place for travelers to stop and take shelter from bad weather or to rest. Um, so there's this theory that people would leave out food and drink before they went to bed in case any travelers traveling through the night came. Um, and needed it. So that might be where that's from. The first print reference really um, in the United States to Cookies and Milk for Santa dates to the 1870s. And it's in a book where a little girl is expressing skepticism that Santa is actually the one who <laughs> eats the cookies and drinks the milk. It's probably a much older tradition than that. Um, but I think it gets popularized in the late 19th century as Santa is getting more and more popular. So how do we get this tradition of cookies and Christmas, right? Well, we've talked about the medieval period and we've talked about the early modern period and our immigrant traditions. Um, but Christmas cookies, why is, why is that a thing in the United States? And there's a whole bunch of big reasons, um, which I alluded to earlier. One is that we have changes in agriculture. So um, sugar refining becomes uh, faster and cheaper, wheat milling, becomes faster and cheaper, transportation of goods becomes faster and cheaper. So these things are just more available to a larger swath of the American public. We also have some, um, some uh, technological advances, we can say, in chemical leaveners. So a lot of the traditional cookies we talked about are not leavened with anything other than eggs, but the ones that are, um, you know, baking soda, you might have seen uh, hartshorn, or baker's ammonia in some really old recipes, baking powder being the combination of baking soda and cream of tartar, right, as a leavener. Um, that just makes it much easier to make cookies. Our kitchen technology makes it much easier to make cookies. I've already talked about, you know, mid 19th century tin smithing it makes, you know, cookie cutters and tin sheets and baking sheets and all kinds of molds much easier. Um, but stoves, when we get stoves in the kitchen rather than an open hearth and a bake oven, that really makes it much easier to make fussier, more delicate foods like cakes and cookies. Um, and also refrigerators. So we have ice boxes and ice harvest throughout the 19th century. But once we start to get electric refrigeration, um, you know, dough that has to be chilled before it's rolled out, sugar cookies, I'm looking at you. Um, ice box cookies where they're just like slice and bake, uh, those start to come to the fore. So that changes how we associate and um, bake with cookies also. So I thought we'd do a little quick comparison of kitchens. This is a kitchen from probably the 1840s. I don't have a date, but just by the clothes, um, middle-class American <laughs> kitchen at this point. Um, so we have this big hearth in the back, that's like the center of the room, that's where all the cooking happens. And we have um, what's called a tin kitchen, which is like a reflective half cylinder with a spit, a turning spit where you can roast meats. 
Um, but there's no bake oven, right? So what's the dessert that we can make? We make pie because you can make that in a Dutch oven. So that's part of the reason also why pie is so incredibly popular in the United States because <laughs> it's easy to make on an open, open fire. Um, 30 or 40 years later, this is what we have. We've got running water, we've got hot water, we've got this big, beautiful cast iron stove. Um, not super sure where the actual baking part of it is, might be here, um, but makes it easier to bake things, easier to control the temperature. We don't have to like do the one and done once a week <laughs> bake oven, um, but we're still making pie because that's still easier than cookies. Um, so electric and gas ovens make baking cookies even easier. It's much easier to control the temperature. Um, but how come they become this tradition in the United States? They weren't always, they were always kind of associated with, with Christmas, but really in the 20th century, like Christmas cookies become more and more of a thing. Um, I think that's in large part due to the technology, but also because, you know, we start to nationalize our food ways. So in World War II, there was like all this propaganda and rhetoric about supporting the troops. And so here they would publish like booklets of cookies that were ration friendly, but that would ship well, that you could send to the troops overseas in support of them. Um, Post-war, it's like we went Christmas mad <laughs> in the 50s and 60s. There's all kinds of cookbooks associated with Christmas published then um, and kind of like ancillary to Christmas, like the Betty Crocker cookie book with the old fashioned cookie spelling. So it's cookies in general, but you can see already there's like a ton of Christmas cookies. Here's spritz, here's gingerbread, you know, here's a candy cane cookie. Um, all these Christmas associated cookies are, are on the front cover there. Uh, and then also by the time we get to the mid 20th century, we're for a lot of people are like third and fourth generation immigrants. And those are usually the generations that try to reclaim some of that immigrant heritage. And for sure, by the 1970s with the bicentennial, people were really interested in these older food ways, including a lot of these historic cookies. So what's the future of cookies, All right? Christmas cookies might be on slightly shaky ground. We've got a million different dietary requirements. Um, you can get pretty good store-bought cookies. They're everywhere. There's also like this huge increase in, in artisan made cookies. I actually know someone who has a whole business where she just makes beautiful royal icing frosted cookies. Like that's her whole job. Um, cookie swaps really start in like the 80s and 90s as we have working moms, right? You don't want to make more than one kind of cookie, but you have a cookie swap with your friends so you can each have some of all different kinds of cookies. But today, cookie swaps are dying, man. People are complaining bitterly about going to a cookie swap and making beautiful giant cookies and getting store-bought cookies in return. <laughs> um, there's also a ridiculous diet culture that says we should not be eating sugar or refined white flour or butter or any of the yummy things that we associate with Christmas. Um, and then there's the whole, do we need traditions, right? Should we keep these traditions alive? So that's the end of my talk. I always end on a question. Do you have any questions for me?